sesión. Eh, en esta ocasión con, con Nicole Ben Shai. Él es un eh, profesor asistente visitante de Paz, Justicia y Derechos Humanos en Haverford College. Eh, eh, Roy tiene, es, es doctor en filosofía por la New School en Nueva York y ha venido trabajando sobre temas relacionados con sobrevivientes del holocausto y en particular en el caso de Jean Améry que eh, hoy ha enseñado en distintas universidades en Israel y en Estados Unidos y ha publicado muchísimo sobre estos temas y tiene un, un volumen de, de ensayos titulado La política del milismo que eh, está próximo a, a salir eh, y ahora voy a, a darnos una plática titulada La quinta autonomía, reflexiones sobre el significado moral de la tortura. Gracias, Jorge. Uh, ok, so, the title of the paper is The Fifth Antinomy, um, and I will be talking about Jean Marie, who Sarvi mentioned. Um, he was born in Austria as Hans Meyer in 1912. And I'll be talking about, he a, was a Holocaust survivor and a survivor of Auschwitz and, um, and an essayist. And I'll be talking about uh, a book that he wrote uh, that combines testimony and philosophical reflection about his experiences in Auschwitz. The Anzai von Schuld und Zune, Beyond Guilt and Atonement, it should be. The English translation is at the Mind Limits, which is the title of the first essay. Um, and you have handouts, I think, I'll show the quotes on this, on the PowerPoint, but all the quotes are from this book, and I'll be focusing on reconstructing the second essay, it's a book of essays, there are five essays, there. I'll be reconstructing the second essay, titled Torture. Um, I share uh, many of uh, Rebecca's concerns and I want to say something that is not in the paper just to kind of frame my interest in, in Jean Manery. You can look in the history of ethics, you can parse it out in various different ways, but one of them is to see that there are two, one of the central oppositions is, is between, um, between Uh, philosophies that are transcendent, or ethics that is transcendent or transcendental, and ethics that is immanent. And by transcendent or transcendental, I mean a dualistic approach to ethics that uh, insist on identifying a separate source for moral thinking and moral motivation than whatever motivates us otherwise. Uh, so morality and nature are distinct. Uh, the, the classic case of this is, you know, we have divine law versus natural law, uh, but Kant is the uh, most prominent uh, attempt to, to create a rational version of this. Uh, the monistic uh, approach, or the, the one that I, imminent approach, is the one that sees that all motivation and whatever uh, morality might be has to be grounded in our natural desire, in natural law, whatever is of survival, whatever it is, uh, we might be able to cultivate uh, our conduct, our behavior, our character, but it has to be uh, at most a dialectical relation with our nature. There's no separate source. Spinoza and Nietzsche, I think, are the paradigmatic uh, accounts of that. And I wrote recently uh, an essay, actually it's in the book, The Poetics of Nihilism, about Amelie and Nietzsche, uh, trying to distance him from the monistic approach. And now uh, this, I took the advantage of this uh, symposium to try and distance him from Kant. And uh, what interests me in Amelie is I think he tries to offer a third way. And what that means is that there is a separate He insists on a se separating moral interests from other kinds of interests, but without appeal to transcend and transcendental and metaphysical. It's a very challenging fit, and uh, I recommend to you, with my own approach, is to approach it with a principle of charity, which means it's not a great challenge to refute the at pretty much every step of the way. 
it is a challenge to see what he's trying to, uh, to lead us to. And I think it can be rewarding, so it's worth to kind of um, bear, bear with him. Um, one more thing that is interesting is he is as this, he's a survivor of torture and a philosopher. I read him as a philosopher. Often he's not read as a philosopher. A lot of it is because biases of philosophers, not because of his fault. Uh, but he is a philosopher. But this a philosophy that stems from an experience of victimization. And this is something that I find important. So. Um, Part one, and there is argument that Nazism was sadism and that its essence was torture. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this, just kind of move through some of his points. He speaks very well for himself, so we'll start with this quote here that you have uh, from the uh, essay um, on torture. No, it's from the preface. Well. Every evil really is singular and irreducible in its total inner logic and it's a cursed rationality. For this reason, all of us are still faced with a dark riddle. It issued, he's talking about the Holocaust, so to speak, through spontaneous generation from a womb that bore it as a perversion. Vida matura, I'll go come back to this term. And all attempts at economical explanation, all the despairing one-dimensional allusions to the fact that Germany is industrial capital, you know, economical accounts, tell the eyewitness nothing, Telling just as little, this is a poke at Adorno as the sophisticated speculations about the dialectics of enlightenment. Um, now, this is a, a definition from the dictionary of something called in medical uh, terminology idiopathic condition that has a resemblance to what I'm is describing here. An idiopathic condition arises spontaneously or from an obscure or unknown cause peculiar to the individual, which means that it's a sui generis. Um, it's debatable in medicine whether, in the philosophy of medicine, whether there are idiopathic conditions, or is it simply that we don't understand the causes. That, I think, is a version of what can be called an antinomy, and I'll, I'll come back to this later. Um, but uh, Ameri, for now, the important thing is to say that Ameri's um, defining evil and in particular National Socialism as idiopathic. Uh, which means that no general historical narrative, broader causal chain or external logic can explicate it. So let us look at how he uh, defines the Third Reich, the, the National Socialism. He doesn't use the term Holocaust. Uh, he writes, I'm convinced beyond all personal experience that torture was not an accidental quality of the Third Reich, but its essence. It was precisely in torture that the Third Reich materialized in all the density of its being. Torture was its apotheosis. That's his claim. In the original paper, I have some dialogue with Hannah Arendt, who makes a similar claim. Total domination, but I differentiate between the approaches. Um, Next, what does it mean for National Socialism, which could not claim a single idea, that's what it says, but did put, possess a whole arsenal of crack brain notions, was the only political system of this century, he argues again against Arendt's a grouping of communism and, and Nazism, that up to this point uh, had not only practiced the rule of the anti-man. And that's an interesting thing, I think, it's an interesting point of discussion, practice a rule of the anti-man, an important phrase I'll go back to, as had other red and white terror regime, but had expressly established it as a principle. Is principle governed behavior the same as, as practice? I don't know. Both of them are pretty bad. But, I, but he makes a certain distinction. It hated the word humanity like the pious man hates sin. Um, what he's trying to establish here uh, is that um, um, while for Hannah Arendt, for example, the destruction of humanity is the ruination of spontaneity in the individuals, and Hannah Arendt is Kantian in that sense, and the possibility of political plurality for Amelie, humanity is destroyed when relationality between people is destroyed, specifically their mutual expectation of help or mercy. 
is destroyed or distorted. Torture is, after all, a relational dynamic which requires at least two antagonistic persons or group, groups, torture and torture, and there remains this distorted relationality Gegen mentioned, which is anti-human, and opposes it to Mit mentioned, which is uh, being with uh, co-humanity, fellow humanity. In such a distorted relation, one side does not only witness the suffering, the insufferable suffering and helplessness of the other, but inflicts it. And so this is how Marie explains the, the ethos of the, the Nazi regime. The Hitler vassal did not yet achieve his full identity as a Nazi. If he was merely quick as a weasel, tough as leather, whatever he needed to be, no golden party badge made him fully valid representative of the fuel. He had to torture, to destroy, in order to be great in bearing the suffering of others, uh -huh. so that Himmler would assure him that later generations would admire him for obliterating his feelings of mercy. Uh, this is extremely perverse on various different levels. It's like when we start thinking about the later generations, do we want to live long enough to meet them is a, is a question, but um, people have studied Himmler's uh, lectures. One thing that uh, I, I have read about Himmler is that his heavy uh, use of deontological vocabulary. It's a duty. Um, so the idea is that Nazi worldview perceived of torture is nothing short of a moral duty. They did not torture out of natural, emotional, self-interested inclination, but in defiance of an inclination not to. And, and that's what they were commended for by Himmler. And, you know, I know you're suffering. I know it's demoralizing for you to give these sorts of lectures. But uh, we are proud of you for, for enduring this. This means that torture was not a means but an end, or in Kantian terms it was a categorical rather than teleological imperative. Um, the Nazis tortured as, as did others because by means of torture they wanted to obtain information that maps perfectly with their records. Important for national policy, yes, but in addition they tortured with a good conscience of depravity. They martyred the prisoners for definite purposes, which in each instance were exactly specified, but above all they tortured because they were torturers. They placed, placed torture in their service, but even more fervently they were its servants. Uh, so it's torture for torture's sake, not a means for an end. And Amiri uh, reminds us that the name for this logic that makes a principle of torture is not totalitarianism, but sadism. And like Bataille, Beauvoir, and, and Lacan before him, he understands sadism as a political, ethical, philosophical <coughs> category rather than a psychological one. According to my well-founded, this is a, for me is a very important phrase, that well, it should be well-grounded conviction. They will not say this in the narrow sexual pathological sense, but according to the categories and the emphasis of the, of the philosophy of the Marquis de Sade, sadism is the disorder that will also come back to the root and what this means, view of the world, is something other than the sadism of the usual psychology books. He wants to eliminate the, the pleasure principle, it's not really. Um, so, uh, part, ah, in the sadistic regime, torture becomes a total inversion of the social world in which we can live only if we grant our fellow men life, easy suffering, bridle the desire of our ego to expand, but in the world of torture, man exists only by ruining the other person who stands before him. Um, so I'm moving now to part two. Um, as I said, I ran through this, but this is the argument. The implications of this argument in relation to Immanuel Kant, and this is what I want to call the fifth antinomy. So, um, what is that about? Kant famously prefaced the critique of pure reason um, with the argument that he found it necessary to limit knowledge, to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith, and the word is the glaube. Uh, this statement contains one of the fundamental gestures of Kant's philosophy, I already mentioned it in the beginning, is a categorical separation of the realm of science, nature, um, theoretical reason, speculative reasoning, theoretical reasoning from freedom, uh, morality, 
practical reasoning. Uh, if moral action has its cause in the free will of rational agents, answerable to moral law, then such action falls outside the jurisdiction of the scientific knowledge, insofar as this knowledge presupposes a causal chain. Uh, in other words, if autonomous agency exists, the emphasis on if, then the relevance of scientific knowledge is limited in principle. Does it exist? Kant says yes, it does. But and although it's not subject to knowledge, I'm talking about autonomous agency, freedom, not subject to knowledge, it is subject to rational or necessary belief, which is Glaube. Uh, ordinarily, conceptions of belief take them, at least by non-believer, take, take them as uh, weaker or lesser forms of knowledge, not for Kant. This is a distinction of kind, not of degree. And Glaube is just as binding as knowledge is, uh, and that, uh, in fact, the overarching claim of that book is that whatever certainty scientific knowledge grants us, it is in the final count contingent on rational belief, since there could not be science except as a product of the minds of free rational beings. Um, the categorical division between these two realms, practical and theoretical reason, uh, and, and knowledge, produces a for antinomies of pure reason, as Kant calls them. These are inexhaustible disputes between mutually exhaustive stances, a thesis and an, anti -the and an antithesis. The third, most famous of them, concerns freedom, uh, and you know, there's a lot to be said about this, and I assume you know it, so I, I just mentioned the antithesis is there is no freedom. Everything in the world takes place in accordance with the laws of nature, the cause of determinism. The, uh, the thesis is there is also another causality, that of freedom. They don't go together. Um, but Kant thinks they should. They should, after they says it's a nice statement, he says, after they exhaust themselves rather than injure themselves in this dialectical battlefield, they should perhaps realize that they're actually not enemies and part as good friends. Uh, how is that possible? So essentially, um, what sets the antinomies of pure reason apart from other intellectual disputes is that they are internal conflicts within reason itself concerning jurisdictions of different rational faculties, so people step on each other's toes in a sense, and conflicting interests of reason and human progress, practical and moral, or theoretical and scientific, these are not conflicts between truth claims about the world. So we just need to understand under what intellectual gesture we're approaching the world, and then we decide as a postulate how are we going to proceed. Um, because of that, the antinomy is resolved. It's arguable whether all of them are resolved. It doesn't matter this one is. Not when one of the sides wins out, but when reason comes to a better grasp of its overarching unity and its inner division organizational structure, this is the task of a critique of pure reason. Uh, it's like when you have a company and it's in shambles, you invite that consultant, gets a lot of money, and draws an organizational structure. And then people know what they do, and who's answerable to whom and who isn't. That's at least I understand the word critique. And the reason I'm summarizing all this is that I think this background allows us to appreciate the philosophical level at which Amelie's argument operates. When he asserts that Nazism was, Nazism was sad, sadism, and his essence was tortured, he presents it as his well-founded, well well-grounded conviction. If you remember, it was more one of the core. Grounded though it may be, he knows that it is a conviction, and is in principle not subject to knowledge or proof. He doesn't try to prove it. But, just like Kant's rational belief, this well-founded conviction does not imply a lack or la lesser form of knowledge, but a limitation on knowledge deliberate limitation of knowledge for the sake of opening up room for what he considers a particularly moral reflection. Uh, in this, but as I will try to show later, not in much else, I mean, is still a Kantian. Like Kant, he believes moral interest is fundamentally distinct from other rational or human interests. He radicalizes this. Kant still finds a way for happiness back through the back door. I mean, um, 
right in his absolutist about the moral difference. It's a, it's a difference. Uh, accordingly, his denial of the relevance of causal explications to the Third Reich de derives from the worry that they entirely sidestep its moral dimension. When uh, Rebecca speaks about this philosophical method, the hypothetical torture, the formal approaches, completely, um, are, they just don't look at torture, they look at other things. Um, so, um, in, in the case of the Third Reich, if not in the case of the United States, and I tend to agree with Rebecca, that it, 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 at least it is an essential question, the moral one. So in the later essay he notes, the atrocity is atrocity has no objective character. Mass murder, torture, injury of every kind are objectively nothing but chains of physical events describable in the formalized language of natural science and whatever empiricist philosophy they are facts within a physical system, not deeds within the moral system. Um, and antinomy, you look at torture, it, we're looking at the same thing, and yet we're not. The physical description of it can be total and complete, not lacking anything, and yet completely oblivious to uh, the moral dimension. Um, that's his claim. And his argument therefore confronts us within a, a, with his own, its own antinomy, a fifth antinomy, I call it. And he does no such thing. Uh, it's my interpretation of the implications of his argument. The thesis of this antinomy is that the idiopathic condition, sadism, evil, and atrocity, exists. The antithesis, it does not. Meaning that even if certain persons and historical events share in themselves irrational, uh, are in themselves irrational, their conduct and occurrence is nonetheless intelligible. They have a cause or set of causes that can in principle be rationally studied, grasped, and inter interpreted. This is a dispute that really necessarily beckons. They can't go without it, people will ask, but, and then the reasons come in, but can't we say that? And the insistence is the insistence on, on a postulate, no. Um, that's, that's the answer. But why, you might ask, should we call this a fifth antinomy rather than seeing it an extension of the third? In other words, isn't the postulation of sadism but an implication, however disparaging, I think Kant might agree, of human freedom? Isn't this what distinguishes moral law from natural laws, that the moral law, unfortunately or not, leaves room for violation. It will always be the case. Uh, but Amelie has something else in mind. And there are two main things that distinguish the fifth antinomy from the third. The first is the third antinomy is about freedom. The fifth is about disease. It's about an idiopathic condition. The one does not, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can argue about that, but the one does not follow from the other. Uh, Amelie does not need the Kantian postulate of agentic autonomy in order to argue and vice versa. Um, B, the second point of distinction where the third antinomy concerns the existence of autonomous agency and hence the individuality and dependence of the subject, the fifth concerns the existence of the complete victim, I will say something about the next part, and hence the vulnerability of a person and inherent rationality of the subject. While these concerns may not be mutually exclusive, we can argue about that they don't follow from each other. So spontaneous action versus spontaneous disease, idiopathic condition, autonomous agents versus complete victim. The first of these points of distinction already outlined in part one. The last thing Amelie wishes to claim is that Nazism was a manifestation of autonomous agency. He barely perceives of Nazism as properly human phenomenon at all and would sooner regard it as anti-human. To clarify this little, let me say something about the free preface uh, Videl, sometimes used Gegen instead, but it means counter or anti, it's frequent in his work. It's part of the logic that he introduces. Uh, it conveys a very particular emphasis. So to recall in the first quote, I said that the third life is, is defined as anti-natural, Videl Natur, Videl Naturish, Videl Natur. We could say that what is anti-natural is at once natural and unnatural. 
And that's what I said in the beginning, there's an attempt to go to a third way between the dualism and the monism, it's this anti contesa uh, It's a, an occurrence in the world that is purely destructive, and in that sense, anti-natural. Uh, so it's in nature, anti-natural, uh, just as what is anti-human is at once human and inhuman. It's a human ethos that disdains humanity. We are looking, therefore, at a different modality of negation than the one usually attributed to subjectivity, this leader. As anti-natural, the idiopathic condition does not occupy a transcendence place, supernatural, superhistorical, but an imminent distortion and aberration. Uh, I call it a, something pathological, but I don't want to burden this paper with, with this term. Uh, the same logic applies to the rationality of such an event. Is it rational? Is it not rational? Amerit does not regard the Nazi regime as irrational, unlawful, or erratic. That would undermine both its singularity and its atrociousness. In quote one, he attributes to it an accursed rationality. Indeed, this meticulously, methodically, efficiently organized modern state, which it therefore links to the philosophy of the Marquis de Sade, is, as a principle, governed behavior, no doubt rationalistic. But since its principle is not reason, but a, not a regulative idea of moral law, but torture and contradiction, it is irrational. It is a rationalist affront on rationality, or in a word, anti-rational. As Amelie puts it in an essay on Auschwitz, uh, the first essay of the book before the essay is, is, is very interesting, I recommend it to you, it's about the intellectual ex the experience of the intellectual in Auschwitz. And what is interesting about it is that he's trying by that, the, the guys that have mentioned, the, by taking the, the intellectual, the men of spirit, we call it, into the camp, there is an attempt to bring philosophy into the camp, rather than a certain reference to the camp, or to the victims of the camp, he's trying to kind of uh, drag reason. And so that, I think, is the operation of it. And he says a lot of things there, but one of the things that are striking, he argues the SS was employing a logic of destruction that in itself operated just as consistently as the logic of life preservation did in the outside world. You always had to be clean shaven. He gives, a, he gives several examples. You don't need more, uh, in my view, than uh, this example. I mean, you had to be clean shaven and you didn't have a way to shave yourself. We can talk about what this creates, that it's, you know, that people kill each other over this, but the bottom line is, is it's absurd. And it's the law of the camp. And so, um, overall he concludes, the system demanded of the prisoners to be and appear strong, otherwise it's systematically weakening. Uh, this means that the conditions were not only physically unbearable, but especially for a person in the habit of trying to understand, critique, and rationalize the world around him. The absurdity underlying this world a direct affront to intelligence. What I want to say, the two sides of Kant's third antinomy express diverging interests of reason and different arrangements of rational faculties. It's an internal critique of reason. Yet I do not know that either of them would be willing to accommodate something that offends or cripples intelligence. That is to say, an experience limit to reason itself. Such a limit, then, is what the thesis of the fifth antinomy argues for limit to reason, and rather than pointing to freedom, it limits it as well. In the next part of the paper, I will discuss at more length uh, the second point of distinction, which is the turn to the victim. Exists as a torture from the perspective of the victim. Now, I think that the whole business with the argument about the sadism of the third life, and that's what I'll try to kind of convince you, uh, is all about impelling um, a turn. Uh, a paradigm shift from agent to victim. It's as if he's trying to say, you, you'll find no answers there. there H Hannah Arendt once said, you know, in the experiences of victims themselves, you, you get nothing but nihilistic banalities, because, you know, at most we learn what happened, but what else will they do as they suffered? Um, 
So it's, you know, that's where it ends. Amelie, I think, would invert it, and that's the point. He's like, in, from the experiences of the perpetrator, which is something ironically that Rand says so many words when she's, in the later work, when she's listening to Eichmann, that's where you find it. Um, but what is there to be gained from the victim experience? Uh, so first of all, he, he makes it that the, the, the paradigm shift uh, known in the first... I'll just say one thing here. That a, it's, it, does, it may begin in Auschwitz for him. It doesn't end there. He would like it to become, and I'll say more about it, an alternate ground for moral reflection replacing the overwhelmingly prevalent focus in moral philosophy, Kant is just an ex extreme case in point, on the actions and intentions of agents. Um, in the preface to his book, he uh, makes a, sh a shift explicit. I arrived at the phenomenon. He calls it Wesen's Beschreibung der uh, Opfer Existenz, translated decently, I think, as a phenomenological description of the existence of the victim. But often existence or existence of the victim is not victimhood in the very loose and general sense we mean. He means something specific by it, something like a complete uh, victimhood. And um, it's a mode of existence that is qualitatively or categorically different than agency rather than its simple absence of loss. For him, the paradigm of such a mode of existence is the experience of torture. He's concerned with the experience of torture, not simply because he wants to put an end to torture, which he does, but because it is a, a paradigm case of the victim existence, and that's what interests him. Uh, so as a rule, Marie uh, generally refrains from graphic descriptions of physical violence, realizing that such descriptions usually shock the reader more than they instruct or provoke reflection. But at the center of his essay, he describes on the essay of torture, he describes the first, of tor first event of torture that he underwent. Why does he describe it graphically? Because he thinks that there's something there that captures the something of the essence of torture by extension the essence of the Nazi regime, by extension the, the, the essence of the victim existence. So we uh, I'll have to... Uh, uh, I'll read it. Uh, in the bunker, there hung from the vaulted ceiling a chain that above went into a roll. Uh, at its bottom end, it bore a heavy, broadly curved iron hook. I was led to the instrument. The hook uh, gripped into the shackle that held my hands together behind my back. Then I was raised with the chain until I hung about a meter over the floor in such a position, or rather when hanging this way, with your hands behind the back. Uh, for a short time, you can hold at a half oblique, so you're trying to hold your body like this. Um, all your life is gathered in a single limited area of the body, the shoulder joints, and it does not react, for it exhausts itself completely in the expenditure of energy. This cannot last long, even for people who have a strong physical constitution. As for me, I had to give up rather quickly. And now there was a crackling and splintering in my shoulders that my body is not forgotten until this hour. The ball sprang from the socket. My own body weight caused luxation and I fell into a void. And now hung by my dislocated arms. It's just that the thing is that there's, uh, we couldn't make it. We tried to. Uh, uh, but the hands are uh, twisted, and uh, which had uh, been torn high, by, from behind, now twisted over my head. A uh, torture, he ends this, from Latin to pere, to twist, what visual instruction in etymology. So the term visual instruction uh, conveys the importance of describing this. And again, I, I, I bring it out, but it's not, he doesn't do that normally. Um, uh, while it is not as he stresses the worst form of torture imaginable, the physical twist it involves experientially captures the essence of torture. And the etymology of the term he wants to say confirms it. This is how we call torture. This is what we call torture, torture. Um, uh, what 
are the elements of this condition that the body is in place in a place of self-contradiction? I, uh, if I understood why my Spanish is not, uh, it's far from uh, efficient. The stress position, you said it's self-inflicted. Exactly. So that's contradiction, and it's where your own body weight causes relaxation, and um, and this body is hanging in the void. Uh, in, uh, from a hook, the legs are not touching ground, the wound in German, the twisted arms lacking any pulling or staying power. I mean, he uses the word now when arriving at the moment of the twist itself, the dislocation of the arms, which the body has not forgotten until this hour, his body. He is now falling into a void, perhaps a void of self or being. This self loss or existence beyond subjectivity and mediation although rare and extreme, becomes for him the paradigmatic case of the victim existence. Uh, it is something that is there after agency. Um, not before. I, and by the way, if lens carries like the regressive thesis, I don't, I don't understand it. I have to tell you the truth because it somehow seems to suggest to this pre-subjective idea what are we saying, that the children, the babies are under torture? I mean, they suffer, but they're not tortured. So there's no regress, regression, that it's, it's a, it's a, at least that I read that in the late scary, there's this kind of like cry of pain, it's something pre-linguistic, there's nothing pre-linguistic about it, I don't think, but uh, um, it's, it's, but it's after the agency, and the symbolism of this moment cuts across his argument as well as his prose. And for example, when he argues that sadism is a disordered view of the world, the word is verrukte. Verrukte means uh, crazy, and in many languages, twisted, like in English means crazy, and in Hebrew it also means you know, loco. Loco has something to do with lo location, right? Maybe this location, I don't know. But, uh, but there's something about this location and this, this twist, but he breaks it in a hyphen, Verrukte, Rukte is back, is a turn behind the back. And this is the term he uses to characterize the Nazi regime, and it, it creates an implicit analogy between the characterization of the regime and the twisted condition of the victim, and emphasizing that its evil materializes not in the will or the agency of the perpetrators, but in the condition of the victim. And this is largely why Amelie categorically shuns explanatory accounts to try and explain the rise of the Third Reich, and perhaps more generally the occurrence of torture as, as such, is to try to explain an experience which the explainer can hardly fathom, nor feels the need to. The tortured person may not know much about the broader context. Concerning this experience, he is an expert, knows just enough to proclaim that it defies rational explication since it destroys the capacity to think. Uh, it is not simply that the experience makes no sense, like gibberish, it has rather the sense of a contradiction. This is why I think that form of torture is so significant. This contradiction is felt in the contradicted state of the body and the unbearable pain it involves, which we cannot experience, but Amelie's visual instruction wants to help us to get some sort of feel or premonition of it nonetheless. And in elaborating on the contradictoriness of it, he writes, pain is the most extreme intensification imaginable of our bodily being. Maybe it's more, maybe it's death. No road can be traveled by logic that leads us to death. Heidegger among many others have argued, Wittgenstein too, but perhaps the thought is permissible that through pain, a path of feeling and premonition can be paved to it for us. In the end, we would be faced with the equation body equals pain equals death, and in our case, this could be reduced to the hypothesis that torture through which we are turned into the body by the other blots out the contradiction of death. It's one word in German, and it allows us to experience it personally, experience our own death. Um, I believe that the irony um, is that the experience of hanging or falling from a void without ground is what grounds this well-grounded conviction that Nazism is anti-rational. <coughs> uh, this is one fundamental way, a uh, difference between Kant's Glaube and this well-founded 
conviction is a Kant's cloud is rounded by the only presence of reason in reflection. It's like the cogito, it's like we cannot, that's why it's so necessary, that's why it's so binding. Reason reflects, reason is there, the spontaneity of reason is present. And this conviction, on the other hand, is grounded in experience, and not in every possible experience, but in a rather exceptional one, occurring in a particular historical time and place. What makes this experience exceptional is its contradictoriness. It renders this logically and transcendentally impossible, uh, just as it's possible to live through, impossible to live through one's own death. What does it mean for Kant's philosophy? Kant lays out conditions for the necessary condition for the possibility of experience. Uh, one thing that defies the alien representation, freedom does not meet these conditions. Uh, it's spontaneous, it means that it does not so space and time are forms of our intuition, cause and effect, the categoric is a concept is a form of our cognition. Uh, freedom uh, does not abide by that. Uh, because it grounds this mediating operation. Uh, I think that what Amerit tries to do is to point to the victim existence as described here as, as an impossible, something we cannot represent. In that sense, it is an experience, unlike in that sense, it's freedom, in a sense, but it is impossible, and impossible, impossible in the Kantian sense. Uh, so it defies scientific explication. For the purpose of illustration, consider that when we, we certainly witness a picture of a person, and we can certainly witness a picture of a person twisted, like he describes, but the picture, and maybe if we picture it in our minds, but the picture obeys the rules of two-dimensional space. Uh, the twist breaks them. That's what he's trying to describe. That's why it's dislocation. And so the picture doesn't get at it. Um, so, um, it limits uh, both theoretical and practical reason. Uh, trust in the world and the moral significance of, the, of its loss is the last part here. Is, uh, a, Carlos pointed out to me I think that the cap Carlos says that he thinks it's a central, I think it is <coughs> central about this, this kind of trust in the world is that it's the, it's the manner by which we turn from an exceptional event in this particular regime to something that is universally binding. It's through this idea of a loss of trust in the world. But without, I mean, the loss of trust in the world is grounded in the thing. Uh, there is a specific problem, one among many problems in Amri's argument is that we cannot share this experience. And it makes it so, you know, it's not well grounded for us, well grounded for him. And not only that, but he's traumatized. There can be no doubt that he's traumatized. And we are in our society, and as much as we bestow a lot of empathy on traumatized people, or we want to, we tend to discredit the credibility of their experience by psychologizing and subjectivizing it. So it's a distorted perception of reality and we need to help a person regain normal perception. That's a problem, especially if somebody is trying to make an argument like that. It will not, it, it completely cuts, cuts short whatever he's trying to say if we psychologize it. So he writes, uh, I am not traumatized, but rather my spiritual and psychic condition corresponds completely to reality. I experience in my existence and exemplify through it the historical reality of my epoch. And since I experience it more deeply than most, I can also shed more light on it. It's not about me, it's about reality. Um, and as Carlos again pointed out, I think Rebecca also brings it up, is there's a tendency not to believe. Um, and um, yeah, so then, but he says that, and he is traumatized, so uh, his judgment is the last one we should trust. So we fall back on the antinomy. Should we trust him? Uh, you know, should we not? And that, uh, I think, unlike Kant's antinomies, will remain in sorrow. Um, 
So let us for now work under the principle of charity and continue our reflection under the assumption that, traumatized or not, Amelie may have something important to tell us, not about himself, and not only about the Third Reich, but about morality and its relationship to nature. He writes, ah. uh, Whoever succumbed to torture can no longer feel at home in the world. The shame of destruction cannot be erased. Trust in the world will not be regained. That's a description of post-traumatic stress disorder, if you will, and, and the um, alienation from the world, incapacity to trust other people. I mean, it takes this condition to reflect not the psychological after effect, but I claim the moral truth of the conflict, of the event itself. What makes the loss of trust truthful is the claim, the most contentious perhaps, is that what is lost is an illusion, however necessary, and it is potentially detrimental. I'm talking about trust in the world. So his claim is the problem is not that I lost trust, the problem is that everybody still has it. And he wants to help. He actually puts it that way. You know, I want, he's trying to help a German society, he writes this in German, to uh, bear the moral truth of the, of the content. The content. Uh, what is trust in the world then? He writes, trust in the world, Weltvertrauen, is a, I don't know what it means in German uh, colloquially, but includes all sorts of things that the irrational and logically unjustifiable belief is implicitly reference, I think, to Hume in absolute causality, perhaps, or the likewise blind belief in the validity of the inductive inference, but more importantly, it is the certainty that by reason of some written or unwritten social contracts, the other person will spare me. I give you a bit of jibe that this belief is not justifiable given the manifest stupidity and occasional meanness of so many of our politicians, policemen, intelligence officers, and fellow human beings. Nothing seems to support this mistrust on a broader scale. Uh, we may surmise that uh, um, as zoological, psychological studies have, that trust is some, not something learned or acquired. It's not rational in that sense, as much as it is a function, a necessary postulate for leading a relatively healthy and functioning existence. We can't bear to, to deal with the possibility of what he's describing. A special problem posed by trust, I claim, is it essentially self-validating and Carlos pointed out, and I tend to agree that it's not necessarily a felicitous term, I mean by that, that trust works in such a way that if there is evidence to the contrary, we don't believe it. We can't believe it. The impossible cannot be possible. Um, and um, this should imply that, so it's like a mental armor in that sense. It, we, we don't wait passively to see whether trust is justified, trust in the world at that level. It has to. So uh, the under, it, it, it implies that underlying and uh, mediating forms of our perception and cognition, which can't cause transcendental aesthetic, transcendental logic, is biological, psychological impulse. Call this, could this impulse, I ask, also be also underwrite the premises of practical reason? Might Weltler Tower be another word for Glaube? Uh, but this I leave it in, in a question. Um, uh, on this assumption, whatever violates or under, underesti uh, underestimates the validity of trust in the world needs to be overlooked, invalidated, or explained away. That can motivate science. It can really motivate science. It can motivate moral philosophy to do that, not consciously, not deliberately, but to explain things away. Uh, here lies the potentially detrimental dimension of this trust and the moral significance of losing it. To argue that succumbing to torture is a capacity to challenge transcendental structures can only mean that they're not transcendental. Um, and the transcendental envelope not only reassures us that knowledge is possible, it also tacitly reassures us that the experience of torture is impossible. If so, then trust in the world stifles conscience and revolt just as it stifles the possibility of undergoing or recognizing a world-shattering crisis. It's very arguable what I'm about to say, but I read in Viktor Frankl, uh, who um, is another survivor, just to see that, that the claim here is contentious. I think Viktor Frankl um, 
makes the opposite claim. He goes into Auschwitz and, sh and, and demonstrates the postulate of spontaneity, of freedom, and of trust in the world. And some people, for there's a famous book, bestseller called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, that takes uh, takes Victor Frankl as its hero. He said, if, 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 in the, if in Auschwitz, a person can be active rather than passive, what are we to say when our boss is on our 